All right, here we are, looking at Atlas Shrugged again, the second half of part one. So, let's start with looking at chapter six. What do you think? What do you think about the the dinner party there, Will? Uh, what, was, what was the first thing that you think about? I think right away I'm struck by just how uncomfortable Hank Reardon was um, having all of these socialites and movers and shakers invited by his wife to this it was their anniversary right and he doesn't really consider them his friends she thought they were his friends and he's just so uncaptivated i'll say by all of the attendees and their subject matter and their empty lofty statements you have all these we've got the the news people and the professors and the philosophers discussing lack of reason being uh not required for any sort of decision making process that reason is just this contradiction that was created and is pointless and that humans don't yeah. actually have any notion of it you see right away the air in the room that the guests were there because they were expected to be invited, not because anybody really wants them there. And then you start to see their twisted ideologies come out. And when uh, yeah. when Dagny first shows up, I have one quote from Lillian Reardon. When Dagny comes in, she says, Miss Taggart, it's such a wonderful surprise to see you here, said Lillian, the muscles of her face performing the motions of a smile. And just moments later, it says James Taggart had entered with his sister. Lillian smiled at him in the manner of a hasty postscript. Just that lets you know that, like, this is just a game they're playing. No one really wants to be there. Especially yeah. Dagny. This whole acting how they think they ought to act because this is the way that these actors are meant to perform this play and it's so very much a play that the, all of these people are involved in outside of Dagny and Hank really the the true protagonists of this story I think I feel a lot of the uh, emotions Hank felt getting through that dinner party it was so tedious and empty for sure and I guess you could add Francisco to that list of protagonists and he shows up to this party too I intentionally omitted Francisco. I've really <laughs> lost a lot of faith in Francisco since his childhood chapters where he was, he showed so much potential and he's just become this, well, this playboy that has all the reason and all, all the resource to succeed and is just pointlessly squandering it and really playing on Earth, this Earth that he has access to. He's flying around willy nilly and making a big farce of his life at this point. And I, I'm quite disappointed in, in him. And it, it only further disappoints me when he rears his ugly head, like in the conversation he has at the party with Hank, where he is determining Hank's character. And it's just like a demonstration of how intelligent the man is and how disinterested he acts. Yeah, and... Francisco's like really pretentious about it. He shows up saying, Oh, I'm just gonna I'm gonna learn everything I know about this guy just from one conversation because you know that's how I've done everything my whole life. I'm Francisco D'Anconia. Nobody fucks with me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And he's just really um I mean I'm sure we'll see him do something interesting in the next parts, but during this part he really went downhill for me. My my favor of him is completely dropped off because, of course, in the earlier chapters that we had discussed, he was coming up with derivatives and mathematical formulas that he hadn't studied but just came to of his own conclusion to make that elevator up the rock face. And then in his adult life, he is now just screwing with people for his own enjoyment. Yeah, he's the embodiment of the cliche of the guy who never had to struggle towards anything because everything just came so easily to him. There's some hints as to like what happened to him when he was at that university, but you never really get the inside workings of his mind. At least we haven't yet. 
It'll unfold in the next two parts, I'm sure. Yeah, um, I want to talk about the drama scene of that party, though. I really enjoyed that. That was the one redeeming quality of this dinner party was Dagny calling out Lillian, Hank's wife, um, yes. over the bracelet. That was absolute justice. I loved it. Yeah, you like that one? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just uh, a pure example of Lillian's absolute disrespect and Dagny's utmost respect at the same time. It's just, you, it's... you don't want it, you think a diamond bracelet's more valuable? Here, take mine and then I'll take, let's trade. You want to trade? Let's trade. It's the most invaluable object ever created because, of course, it's the first thing ever made out of this new metal alloy by Hank Reardon, Reardon Metal. And he's given it to his wife. And right away, we saw in the earlier chapters, his mother calls him conceited and pretentious for giving her this gift that other women would have expected diamonds. And he's presenting this this chain that he's putting on his, his wife that she just doesn't even care about it or him, and then to have Dagny disrespectfully demonstrate how much respect she has for him by, by doing a faux pas at this dinner party. Because, of course, everyone looks on in awe, shock, disgust, and shame at this action where she's saying, no, I, I would respect this item. I want it. It matters to me, and I see how important it is. Where all these players who are so fake look at this action and say, oh, you, you spoke out of turn, you've done something wrong, when really she's doing something so very right. Yeah, she's sticking to her values and her own principles. And then Hank is watching the whole thing, and he's, he's at this party just seeing this dinner party as almost a punishment to him. It's because he sees all these people he doesn't want to see, and he could be out somewhere else having a, a business meeting or looking at his minds that he's trying to invest in him participating in the party is like him taking ownership of his own heartlessness because he feels like he's betraying his own family by feeling like he doesn't want to be there yeah and then you have the comment from Dagny to him that he doesn't really touch but obviously it sticks with him as we see later in this section but she says that she never understood these gatherings that seemed so empty and that really the only people that should celebrate are those that have earned the celebration to have all these pedants involved just because they have this social status that they ought to be involved they, they're they meant to be invited and really they have no interest in what the real purpose of anything is and they're just maintaining this social construct to feel good about themselves and it makes you wonder just how good they do feel about themselves being so empty. That's that's well said. Well, thank you. The only other part in this party that I wanted to go over was, you know, another answer to one of this book's great questions. Who is John Galt, right? Because someone there claims to know. Yes. One, one of the party goers says, you keep saying who is John Galt, but I can tell you if you'll listen. And when she finally gets to tell the story, she says that John Galt is the one who found Atlantis. Only A one man... A and rich explorer. Our first um, story of who John Galt is is introduced to us. And it, it's interesting, just such a, an... I don't know, I want to say elegant story about who this man is, this brave explorer who searched the whole world and I think they'd say the ship sank, right, when he found Atlantis? He sunk the ship. Sunk the ship. Because there was only one survivor from that ship, and the woman who claims to know who John Galt is, she knows the man that survived, supposedly, right? So yeah. the survivor claims that John Galt, when he found Atlantis at the bottom of the ocean, he sunk his own ship to get there. So that's a pretty good metaphor whatever you want to take from that right yeah moving forward into chapter seven we start the process of developing the the john galt line right that is correct we start with uh all the speculation and the critiques of the metal they say how can a how can this be stronger and more dense and 
more malleable than steel or whatever it is that they claim. This new miracle metal. There's no, there's no possible way that it can be what they say, but there was one meeting with between Hank and a representative of the Science Institute. First, he starts off by convincing him that the patent's not going to go through and no one's going to use the metal. And then afterwards, when he sees that Hank isn't going to back down, he says, you don't care about all these people. He tries to guilt trip them. And then it degrades into a, well, let me buy the patent off of you. And then Hank just basically tells him to get out. And it was an interesting conversation because he's really, he's propositioned and he does sit down and he is, his interest is piqued and he, he humors him for the moment because, of course, Hank is a man who is about making a profit and he goes into business to make a profit. And he's very clear about his intentions. And when he is sat across the table of a man offering him millions of dollars, a complete return on his investment, he stands firm and says, no, this is mine. I've made this. I've put 10 years into making this and it will be me who brings it to the world and I won't sell it to you because that will prevent my product from ever being mine again and from ever being exposed to the world. And he, he ends up kicking this man out and the man is offering him government money. And it's, again, we see this emptiness of players that are just doing what they've been told. We don't know where, at what point... Um, this man has been uh, convinced to go to Hank, but we do know obviously there's higher powers that are trying to make this metal disappear, which is a theme that we've seen in the real world where something revolutionary comes around and is suppressed. And it's something Absolutely. that Absolutely. Artificial I intelligence, for example. Artificial intelligence, the electric car, all sorts of things get suppressed because of this political rigmarole that says oh, well, actually, that's not how the world progresses. It doesn't matter if it's good for the world. What we need is good for the, goodness for the economy. And it comes from this weird, farcical nature that talks about equalization of opportunity. And what ends up happening is, well, the technology does surface. It comes out a few years down the road, like this man from the Science Institute is saying, just... We need to wait a few years so that everyone else can get their hands on it, so that everyone else can get their piece of the pie. But the detriment is to society because society is collapsing at this point in the book and Reardon Metal is propped up to be the solution. And everything is going against Hank to, to have this success, to, to change the world as it is known with this a metal alloy that's three times stronger than steel and half the weight and a quarter of the price because no one is positioned to profit from it. Yeah, and you really see the the jealousy factor too because it's clear that he's not using any ores that nobody else has access to. He just found a way to mix them to make the, the most uh, efficient product, right? Yeah, but there's a there's a there's an argument in the book in this chapter at some point where someone says, "Well, if this metal was really that great, then someone would have come along already and made it. And then why didn't anybody?" And then Hank just says, "Because I did." Well, exactly. And that's and beautiful. That's, and yeah, we exactly. see this in James Taggart a lot, especially in a, in a later chapter where he's philosophizing this nihilistic view of the world that no one's created anything and there's no brilliant men and all inventions are built on the inventions and the forwardness of, of previous humans that is built on the um, creativity of other humans and that no one should be given the gratification of saying they've invented anything because they couldn't have invented it if it weren't for all of the other inventions that came before them. And so no man is great for doing anything that is great because he couldn't have done it without the greatness of everyone that came before him. And so you're left with this society in James's view where no one does anything good. And it's just yeah. this perpetuation of this weird philosophy where what happens at the end of the day is depression and James Taggart is quite depressed and he's got this ideal ideology that really chains him to this 
awful world view that no one is successful and there is yeah, no such just, thing as success. It's just not productive to live in that space. And on that and note, you really see uh, Hank's genius come through when he comes up with that new design for the the truss and the arch for the for the bridge that saves them over half the original cost of the of the entire bridge. Uh, yeah, and it's four times the output at like a third of the price. Even I think it was lo- lower than that. Even it was, I think it was it was from two million to eight hundred thousand. I thought it was three million, and then he turned around and invented the truss, and it was even less than eight hundred thousand. Yeah, I think there. Yeah, there was another conversation where someone quoted to Dagny that it would cost over, like five or six billion or million. Sorry. Yeah, that was her engineers. But yes, then, true. Then Hank quoted two million, and made the design, and then he developed the new truss and arch, and then it was shaved down to eight hundred thousand, with the extra lines on the bridge as well, the extra yeah. track. And then you have Dagny go to the Science Institute to find, because there's this big smear campaign throughout these chapters of this Reardon medal, as we were, were touching on, and a statement comes out from the, the State Science Institute that doesn't really say anything, but it's this propaganda piece that says that there may be a chance that perhaps this metal isn't good, not that it can be proved, but that we shouldn't uh, disqualify the notion that perhaps it's bad. Yeah, and, and that's so presented she, that's presented as a retaliation from the Science Institute from Hank not selling his own patent. Because yes. the Science Institute was also simultaneously working on their own different kind of metal, which has been so far unsuccessful. So they're trying yes. to blackmail. Their metallurgy department has failed to produce anything of significance since their inception and So Dagny goes and talks to the founder of the organization, whose name escapes me right now. Is it Stadler? Yeah, that's Dr. Stadler. So she goes and she meets with Dr. Stadler because she doesn't understand how a man who created such a brilliant institute wouldn't want the truth and the rationale and the reason to come out into the public eye so that the world could move forward. And you see a man on the other side of James Taggart's philosophy, which is this philosophy that it doesn't matter what a, the truth is, it doesn't matter what the reason is, that there are certain things that have to happen to make the world a better place. And this Dr. Stadler has been completely crushed under this non-existent object of, of philosophical idealism. And he's completely defeated because he realizes that he is subject to his funders. And his funders are this metaphysical propaganda political machine that doesn't want the world to be a better place. They want the world to be a better place on their terms and their terms are destroying the world and destroying the people that know the scientific truth of the metal. And he knows that the metal is great, but there's nothing he can do about it. And he won't denounce the statement because he's given up on making good change in society. Yeah. There's a lot of, philosophical tribalism going on in this whole game that they're playing and it's really interesting because i know from my own experience i've worked in a factory in the real world and i've looked at systems that are failing and i've said but why can't we just do this this way why can't we just do this in a way that would be more efficient and it doesn't matter it has no statistical weight because the factory's already built and the system's already in place and the people that make the decisions don't want change. They don't want to sacrifice any time to revolutionize their system because their system is already making them profits. Even though you suggest, okay, well, if we just stopped everything we were doing for 36 hours, retrain people to do this in a new procedure that would cut costs and increase morale, you'd see a higher return, but you'd lose that day and a half. And there's just no interest. You, you don't change the system. It, you just work the system. And that's what you see a, a lot of the time. It's these huge organizations that are bigger than any individual person, any individual stockholder or CEO. 
and they're at the whims of lobbyists. Yeah, and you could extrapolate that point even further to relate to the human race. Like, I've been reading this book, Sapiens, right, by Yuval yes. Harari, and he makes the case that, you know, the agricultural revolution when we started growing wheat in the ground, like, that, that was when wheat domesticated us. He sees that as a mistake. Like, if, if people with his view would have their way, we would go backwards in time before the agricultural revolution and take a different path. And that's, that's almost what it feels like you're proposing sometimes when you just go to your boss and say, hey, why don't we just do it this way? And like, are you kidding me? Lose a day and a half of production? If it's, it sounds like the same thing as just, okay, we just can't grow wheat in the ground anymore. We need to get all of our food and sustenances from hunting and gathering. And it's interesting, you know, because we see in the book they're talking about after the, the line is completed, they have this, this brief moment with Ellis Wyatt and Hank Reardon and Dagny Taggart. They're at Ellis's house, and they have a cheers because they've had this great success. They've beaten the political propaganda system that had every reason to stop them from making this line to Colorado, this bridge over this canyon, and to run a train at 100 miles an hour to deliver goods and export goods and make work and business for the country. They, they celebrate. And for just one brief moment, Ellis Wyatt says, let's just hope that this stays the same. And in anger, throws his glass at the wall because he knows, it, a part of him knows that there's no way their successes will be enough to change the system. Yeah, I love the symbolism there too because the glass shatters creating a change, right? It's just, exactly. it's, it's inevitable. And, and so, like, what you have is, like, uh, going back to that factory experience I'm talking about, the whole notion of shutting down production for 36 hours means that you're not meeting your shippers. And if you're not meeting your shippers, you're not making profit. But in order to meet your shippers, right now you're putting out overtime hours and your expenses go up because now you're doing overtime. You're paying... 50% more for every hour that the factory is being run. You've got more electrical bills just so you can meet the shipper. And you still don't meet the shipper and you fail to. But you can't shut down the factory because if you shut down the factory, you'll definitely not meet the shipper. Even though stopping what you're doing, assessing the situation and coming up with a better system would in the long run create a better environment, it's not up to any person who you'd think was in charge of making decisions. You can't tell the owner of the factory, okay, well, let's do it this way. Because he, he says, well, I can't do it that way because the owner of the conglomerate of factories doesn't abide by that. We need to meet our shippers. And if we do that, we won't meet our shippers. And if we don't meet our shippers, we won't be in business. Yeah, you need to have someone truly temperate in charge of making those decisions. And the system breaks temperance. It, it grinds temperance out of yes. the soul of humanity. It forces one to exhaust all their resources all the time. So there's never any room to, you know, detach and look back at it and see where you made all the mistakes and fix those before you go forward onto your broken system. And, and you can look at this to... across the board, right? Like this is in education, this is in production, this is in the food industry, this is in the produce industry, you have people burning out and accepting the lot that they have and doing everything they can to just get through the day and eat dinner, have a drink, go to bed, and try again tomorrow. But they're already burnt out before tomorrow comes. Yeah, exactly. There was a, another section in Chapter 7 near the end where Hank Reardon's mother comes in to uh, the factory, has a meeting with Hank, and has the audacity to tell him that he needs to give his little brother Philip, who seemingly hasn't worked a day in his life, a job at his factory because he needs it, and for no other reason. Yes, and that left a really bad taste in my mouth. You have this woman who, every time you've seen her interact with the golden boy of the family, the success, the industrial magnet that is Hank Reardon, the inventor, the business magnet. Like, he's, he's incredible. And every time she interacts with him, 
she has nothing but shame and disgust and contempt for him. And she comes in with this socialist ideology that because they're related by blood, not even that, because he is his brother, he is supposed to have in himself this brotherly love that says, although my brother is incapable of producing any sort of value for me, it is my obligation now because I'm in a position to support him, to give him an empty role in my mill so that he can have a salary, so that he can feel good about himself. And it's this non-contradiction that's talked about in this whole part, right? Where yeah. you need to be able to have your own work that gives you steady pay so you can be proud of yourself. And she's asking for him to give him this lie, this empty lie that says that he is working and he can be proud of his money that he's earned without ever earning a dime. And he kicks his mother out. He says, this is a farce. Don't ever come in here again and asking me for something like this. This is just absolutely appalling. Yeah, and when his response is obviously, hey, you want me to give him a job? There's not a job here for him. And then she says, well, I guess that means you don't love your brother. I guess that's it. Just heartbreaking. And that's what it takes to be in that position to expect something for nothing. And when you don't get it, to be able to blame the person you're asking for the golden ticket to just say, oh, well, that's because they are without love. And to be able to sit on this high horse and say that I love humanity more than myself. And if I had millions of dollars, I would distribute it to the masses to make the world a better place. Well, the masses wouldn't be very happy if they hadn't earned it. And that's what isn't really talked about in that conversation is that his brother wouldn't feel good about himself if he was sitting in an office for eight hours a day doing nothing and getting paid for it. There would be no reward that came from it. Absolutely. Philip didn't come asking for a job. He actually loathes his brother for what he does. He doesn't see him as a valuable part of society. Remember, Philip's the progressive lefty. He doesn't actually want anything to do with the factory, but his mother comes in and says, I know what's best for both of you. You have to give your brother a job, when really it, neither one of them would want that. Well, and it ties to that core um, philosophy that Anne Rand is, is really discussing in this fiction. You know, she's wrapped up this interesting philosophy of objectivism, I believe, in this book. And she talks about, and you can see, I've seen some quotes from her where she says, look, welfare doesn't make men happy. That doesn't give them freedom. That doesn't give them determinism. The only way to make men free is to give them the opportunity to earn a living. And it's through earning their money that they can feel free. From a religious perspective, one might say, take your cross and carry it up the hill. Find your cross and bear it. Exactly. And to expect a handout to make any difference is short-sighted because what happens is, and especially you can see it in Canada, you get trapped in this system where now you're not obligated to work. You're getting this paycheck through this welfare system. And if you even so much as think of trying to work, your money gets cut. So now you've created a system that people cannot grow out of. And they become prisoners, and it's, it's absurd. And it's very clearly demonstrated that it's absurd. Yeah, I think a lot of the blame can be put on the education system, but who am I to make such claims? And again, so we look at the education system and we say, well, where did that system come from? Because I don't think the education system was initially established to create a higher school of thought. I think young people that weren't able to share their burden and work on the farm needed to go somewhere else for eight hours while men did work. And then we had a system that was now established from this whole farming society, again, to go back to your domestication of the human race with wheat. Now we've got a bunch of children in a room and while they're there, they may as well learn something. But 
what we teach them is just simply that that is enough to get them back to the position of being able to work. Enough and to so become you, a cog and nothing more. Exactly. A cog in a machine that wasn't created intentionally. Or maybe it was. I can't say for sure. But this, this machine built itself, I would really pause it. Because I think that we established the systems that built the machine that we then realized we had to mold cogs for. Because without the cogs, the machine would break. And without the machine, the cogs would break. But realistically, the systems that built the machine and the systems that polished the cogs aren't the right systems. And it's very easy to see that it doesn't lead to happiness. Yeah, it's the like we built set. a machine. Yeah. It's like we built a machine and then realized that we were short a few parts. We needed the people to fill in the spots. And then again, we get trapped in this burnout cycle. So now you have a teacher who's trying to make the world a better place, but at the end of the day, they're, they need to demonstrate on paper that their students have learned something. And so you have standardized testing and you have a standardized curriculum and you don't look at the society, you don't look at the needs of the area and you don't specialize your education system to actually fix a problem. You, in fact, don't specialize your education system at all. You just have a standard curriculum to get a standard cog. And as we come into this 21st century, we're noticing and we're attempting with great success in many areas that uh, it's not working and we need more. We need to do something differently and we need to create a, a race of people that are putting human values higher, but not forgetting what it means when you sacrifice something. Because when you give away 90%, you don't feel 100%. And when you give away 10%, the world does not run. So there's this balance that hasn't been met, but we need to, to come to this middle ground where the output of human creation is actually leading to innovation and change that is good and growth that is stable. And that connects to the, the John Galt metaphor, which brings us to the, the second explanation yes. of who is John Galt. And another character, I don't remember who gave us the second story. but I don't either. I'm going to have to start taking notes like that. Someone else comes into the, the spotlight and tells the second story of who is John Galt. And they tell the story of the man who climbed up a mountain and uh, found the fountain of youth and it took took him 10 years to climb and nothing could be brought down not only that it took all of his existence to get to the top of that mountain he lost his skin and his life to get to there to try and bring this back to humanity but when he got there he realized that it couldn't be brought off the mountain like you said and that there was so much sacrifice required for him to get to this place that he thought was the answer that he would be able to share this glory with humanity. And when he got there, he very quickly realized, you can't bring the fountain to the people. You cannot make a horse drink. You can bring a horse to water. Yes, exactly. So you see the similarities between the stories where you can't go back and you can't help anybody else. You, you either sink your ship and you sacrifice everything to get to Atlantis, or you climb up the mountain and sacrifice, leave behind everything just to get to the top of the mountain. Then you can stay up there. And you can't help anybody else by taking your own journey. Everybody has to take that journey and make their exactly. own sacrifice. And that's just it. And how, how do you convince a, an entire nation that there is a better way to live, that movement towards this goal is of benefit when you're just trying to get your paycheck and you're just trying to get another meal for your children and you're just trying to get to Friday and you're just trying to please your wife. Yeah, you need a, a better goal than make it to the weekend. And we see again that symbolism of that calendar comes back into play. The, the days are numbered. There's a couple of times where the calendar symbolism pops up again in this part. Yes. And it's this construct, this time management construct of human creation. 
it, it doesn't necessarily lead to peace of mind. In fact, I'd argue the opposite, but that it indicates where you are on the timeline before your bills come out, before your week is over, before you've earned as much as you can, before it's time to do all these things that are imposed upon you, not to further the race, but to perpetuate your existence. And you have millions of people that are in love with the notion that they could have what they have now in the future. And they're dedicating all their time to preserving what they have now for their future self without looking and without being able to see the bigger picture. Yeah, it goes back to the ancient Greek idea that we were discussing the other day with uh, exactly you're acquiring what you have in the future which is something that you don't have right now you have to go and get it and then you have this character like Dagny who and like Hank who doesn't look at what they have in fact I don't think there's ever a point in this first part where Hank or Dagny have this moment where they think oh I need to eat something or oh I need to sleep or oh I can't do what needs to be done because of this reason or excuse they ha that's not a question on their mind they see obstacles as opportunities to discover solutions to the obstacles to move them closer to their goals and I think there's this big dichotomy drawn between these two types of people in this book and there's the people who blame the system they're in as an excuse for why they didn't have success and there's people who know the system is corrupt and do everything in their power to succeed and then do succeed yes absolutely like we have i forget his name but dagny goes on a quest to find an inventor that we'll we'll delve into in a moment but on this quest, she meets varying sorts of people in different walks of life that have failed. The, that is the one trend that connects them, is that they've all failed. This collapse of this motor company, this bank loaner, and this factory purchaser, they've all failed. But they don't ever look inside themselves and say, oh, what I could have done was this. Because they don't see themselves as the failure. They blame the system. They say, oh, well, if the rich had given me more money after I went bankrupt, I could have succeeded. If I hadn't had the competition, I could have succeeded. And they have nothing to show for themselves. They think of themselves quite highly because they cared about people and they were doing it not for themselves, but for the good of their brothers and for the good of humanity and failed. They took their ideology, they ran with it and they failed in business and they didn't once think about making a profit and so they think because they failed and didn't make a profit ever that they're good people and they've contributed nothing to their society. Yeah, absolutely. But before we go too farther, too far into that, I was going to pick out a line that I felt was one of the most relevant pieces in this book so far. That if it was true when... Ayn Rand was writing this book, then it's definitely still true today. And it starts, it's uh, at the point where the John Galt line is completed and the reporters are all interviewing Dagny. And it, it starts like this. The reporters who came to the press conference in the office of the John Galt line were young men who had been trained to think that their job consisted of concealing the world from the nature of its events. It was their daily duty to serve as audience for some public figure who made utterances about the public good in phrases carefully chosen to convey no meaning. It was their daily job to sling words together in any combination they pleased so long as the words did not fall into a sequence saying something specific. They could not understand the interview now being given to, but now being given to them. Right, and you have a, a few different snippets as well. I remember there's a line about uh, how public opinion just simply manifests as a collective understanding without any reason or cause, and that it just simply is, when realistically these propaganda stories are driving public opinion and 
the interview that they are doing now completely baffles these reporters because, of course, Dagny is giving them cold, hard facts. And she's saying, this is what's going to happen. And I am doing this to make a profit because this is a good thing and it is going to work. Instead of these platitudes of ideals that do nothing in terms of reporting the news and they don't know how to spin this story. That's the job of the journalist, right? To spin the story. What more, what more can they do? There was one question that uh, someone asked her, uh, what do you expect to get out of this? Or what do you expect to accomplish with the John Galt line? And she says, I expect to make a pile of money. And the, yeah. and the reporters say, oh, come on, Dagny, don't say that. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't want the public to think you're just in it for the money. And it's like, well, she turns around and says, no, you, quote me verbatim that I am in it for the money. I am in business to make a profit. If I have a good idea that will benefit humanity and along the road I can make money, I will be able to continue to produce things that will be good for societies. Yeah, and she and, puts her money where her mouth is, too, because at the end of the interview, she's like, oh, by the way, I'm going to be on the train. You know that, right? Going 40 miles an hour over the current speed on this rail that's never been tested. I'll, I'll be on that train. And then Hank says, oh, you forgot to mention something. Why didn't you tell them I was going to be there, too? And then, of course, Mr. Reardon, we're both going to be on the train. Mm-hmm. So you see them both willing to put that sacrifice forward and that just like pervades their confidence in the rail itself. And after it does succeed, because of course it succeeds, you have, you flip over to James and he's utterly depressed in the height of this glory that Dagny has disappeared from Taggart Transcontinental. She's made her own company under her own name so that if it were to fail, Taggart Transcontinental would have no involvement in her actions. Now that it's succeeded, it's being reconsumed by the whole, and James is being postered up as the man who made it happen. And so he has every reason to be proud of himself, even though, of course, he's done nothing. The board of directors and the public opinion say he's the reason this has happened and he can't even go to his house because he's so philosophically uh, lost and he meets this 19 year old shop clerk who is just completely a hero worshiper of him and thinks this is the greatest thing that has ever happened and that he's a great man for having done it and he just says this ridiculous line that no man has ever done anything good and that everything that has ever been done is just built upon everything else that has ever been done. And so no man should feel responsible or proud of what he's done because he hasn't done anything because he couldn't have done anything without everything else that was done. And she yeah. doesn't get it. She's completely naive and she thinks, well, that's ridiculous. If anyone has any reason to be happy, it should be you right now in this moment. Your stock is going up. You've got a successful line to Colorado. and you're rich, you're famous, and you're on the front of the newspapers. Why aren't you happy? Yeah, and I think a big part of why he is actually so miserable is because I think what little happiness he does get, he gets from manipulating other people into getting what he wants. And how he achieved this one, he didn't even manipulate anybody. He just accepted what his sister gave to him and said, this is what we're doing, this is how I'm going to do it, you're going to get all the credit. I don't care and he's just wallowing in the fact that like not only did he not have a part in building the line he didn't even you know win win one over on somebody by conniving them or backstabbing them it's mm -hmm. that much worse and it opens up that uh, scene with James in such a a beautiful way where he walks out of a door and he sees the rain and everything else around him and he views it as a personal conspiracy against him and I think that's a that's a worldview that we need to get rid of yeah because that's just it happiness doesn't come from the events in your life it's how you perceive the events in your life and his perception clearly is this one of blame that if 
the world had acted differently, that he'd be able to be happy. If, if everything had aligned right for him, that he'd be in this position that he'd be happy with, but that he could never get there because that's not the world he lives in and that's not how the world works. And so he just spends his life blaming others and doing everything he can to make a profit, but not in a, a productive manner. He doesn't produce a damn thing. He's inherited this role from his father and he's just perpetuating this fake aristocratic lifestyle of making movements in the news and pulling the wool over the director's eyes and in some degree he does affect change but not in the way of inventing reared in metal or laying a train track but just in this very weird political sphere of high ideals and empty statements. And I, I don't see any man doing that ever being happy with themselves or their life's work, or even being in a position to blame themselves for their unhappiness, because it's not them, it's everyone else. And the scene ends with him feeling superior to everybody else anyway, because he has the drinks and he says like, only a truly unhappy person can be truly virtuous, right? Mm-hmm. Which is a twisted ideology on its own. But then he sees himself as even more virtuous because he didn't make a move on this 19-year-old impressionable girl. Yeah, and that was ridiculous too because he knows that he will and that he had full control over the situation. And he exerts this control of not doing this primal animal act as it's so often described in this book and just simply delivers her to her house and then makes her feel awkward for even suggesting that he's a good man for having not done it. Yeah, exactly. And it's very odd. But then we, moving on from this nihilistic worldview, we have this chapter 9 opportunity which is this discovery of another innovation because this book is very much pushed forward by these innovations in the first part it was hugely the hank reared in metal that was this lifeblood of the transcontinental railway that without the ability to purchase something that's better and cheaper than steel they would have gone under in the fourth chapter and instead this an innovation has uh propelled them forward and now, having done all that they can with this new metal and feeling that they've established themselves in a position where they'll be able to continue with it, they go on a vacation. Dagny and Hank go around the country and yeah. they get to the 20th century motor factory. And they after, after, they find discover, their after they discover the romantic part of the story with themselves. Yes, <laughs> we've certainly glossed over the entire affair of Hank and Dagny. I don't know how they, much they got need on to that go train. With. They got on that train and rode it all the way to Funky Town. We'll leave it to it's, that. <laughs> leave it exactly. At that. Honestly, I think that affair left me hanging at the end of every page and at the end of every meeting that those two had. And I think the reader can experience that in their own right because, of course, this love affair is so beautifully written. Yeah, and it's really unique in the form that, like, uh. I don't know. Ayn Rand has a very different perspective on interrelationships, stuff like that, than I've seen in other novels. And so I'll, I'll leave that discovery to the reader, because I really do suggest everyone reads this book. It's beautiful. It's a commitment. I mean, it's 1,100 pages, but gosh, is it ever worth it. Certainly after reading only 300 pages, I feel that way at least. I just want to talk about this new discovery, though. Yeah, for sure. Go on. What did you think? when? Because... Growing up in the age that I've, I've grown up in, I remember 10 years ago, the electrical cars. I don't know if you saw the, the documentary of all of the electrical cars getting put up in parking lots and the ideas getting shut down and nobody cared. And then finally we had a man like Tesla, Elon Musk, comes out and says, screw you guys, I'm building an electric car. And he is so very much a Hank Reardon, isn't he? Because he doesn't care what the political parties say. He's made his electrical car. And what happened is, in 10 years, since the electrical cars first came out and got shut down, 
well, now everybody's got an electrical car. Every big motor company has an electrical car. And Elon Musk is producing electrical sports cars, which are inaccessible, unattainable. You, as a working class citizen, won't buy a Tesla. But you could buy a Nissan Leaf. You could buy the electrical car that came out by Ford. That's yeah, only there's 30, tons of hybrids. There was smart cars. <laughs> Remember when smart cars came out? Everyone thought it was a joke. Mm-hmm. Like no one and took now, them seriously until Elon came came along and stepped up the game. But he, he did really it in innovated a way, the technology. But he did it in a way that positioned all of the major players to make a buck. Because it's two hundred grand to get a brand new Tesla sports car, but it's only forty grand the regular cost of a lease. Anyone can lease or finance a, a new car that is completely electric now. All of the major players have an electric car on the market, and it's a consumer electric car, and you can get it charged, and you can charge it at your house and never have a Tesla. Instead of turning around and producing a cheap electric car, he produced something that allowed all of the current systems to continue to persist. He gave all of the factories enough time to manufacture their own electrical car. Whereas in this book now, we see this discovery. They go to this old factory, that, and it's talked about a couple times. It was a weird occurrence that it shut down. No one was really sure why. And we still haven't really figured out why it was shut down or what happened. We know that the heirs screwed it up with their communist yeah. ideals. We go on what, a big wild goose, goose chase to but figure what we out really who lost the factory. Is there's this gem hidden in the factory, the static electric motor that can produce energy while using energy to produce energy. All it needs is a few drops of fuel to get the converter going, and as it flies through space and time, it harvests static electricity to produce something that weighs an eighth of a diesel motor and has four times the propulsion, an, in, an innovation in the same class as rear and metal. And now Dagny is searching the country to find out who invented it, but he's gone into hiding because for some reason, unbeknownst to us, whatever political bodies at the time shut it down. And it's so reading it, it was just, it miffed me. It caught me off guard. It slapped me in the back of the head and said, yeah, this isn't a new concept. Governments working around the world and around the country to stop innovation and good products from coming out because it won't make them money. They want to stop it, wait a few years, absorb the patents, make their own versions, and get a cut of the pie before any new change comes out. You can't just change the world and create the thing that will make the world a better place. You have to create the thing that will kind of make things better, but everybody still gets their money. Yeah, I wonder if that was like a a concept that they actually played with, pulling static electricity out of the atmosphere, or so they describe it. You know, I hadn't Googled that yet, and that was a couple of things. Funny how easy it is to just say that, eh? Google it. Um, But that's, like, I wanted to look up and see where we were at as a, a real society in the real world with this whole metal alloy, three times stronger than steel, half the weight. But an electrostatic motor or a capacitor motor is a type of electric motor based on the attraction and repulsion of electric charge. There's certainly a Wikipedia page on it. I haven't heard about it. And I have no idea where we're at with it because, of course, it's not a a public thing. It's definitely not in our public sphere of of known types of propulsion motors. And you have to wonder when that got stopped why that got stopped either way it's not really it's not really important to the narrative that much because like you look at reared metal and say yep that's just magic steel this motor yep it's just a magic motor doesn't really make a difference they did something it's a metaphor they created they created a technological breakthrough that got left behind in a factory and abandoned because no one would recognize it for what it was and okay, so but here's the thing, because you have to know the backstory on the electrostatic motor when you're reading this book. Because in the 1740s and 50s, the first electrostatic motors were developed by Andrew Gordon and Benjamin Franklin. Hmm. And you look at this and you say, okay, well, what is she actually telling us? What is going on in this world that something 
has been around for 280 years and we haven't seen it in the mainstream markets. Why doesn't the human race progress through innovation? What is it that causes us to make change at a societal level? Because it's certainly not the best technology. If it was the best technology, everyone would have access to the best technology. It would be made readily available because it would be more receptive to causing better government, society, and world. But that's not what fuels it. That's not what drives our economy. And it's this economical engine that, that drives it. And it's very weird. Mm -hmm. like, Too many factors, like we said, that uh, things that could have been fixed if we just stopped, detached, took a look at it properly, and worked out all the bugs before we kept building on it. And how many hours are wasted, like it's talked about, how many hours are wasted in a human life doing things in an inefficient way? How many years do we lose with labor that should have been replaced by a better system? Mm-hmm. Where are we standing in our dissolution of these five chapters? We must be closing in on chapter 10. Yeah. Chapter 10 was the actual road trip. The end of chapter 9 was when Hank showed up to Dagny's apartment and said, hey, let's go on vacation. Then it ends, mm -hmm. and then chapter 10 was when they find the motor and track down the people that lost the factory, and we meet the Starnes kids who uh, are just miserable and I would describe them as incarnate of Karl Marx, personally. Yeah? Because <laughs> when we meet the the daughter, I'm not sure her first name. I don't but remember it either. We meet the two children of this guy, Jed Starnes, who built this factory. Well, I'm not sure if he built it, but he he gave it a name. He was responsible for... It's good management for all the time that it was running. And the kids mm -hmm. run, run it into the ground with a plan that they developed that I suspect was just a copy of the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> Which is completely likely in that time period, right? It it's, reflects, of course, that time period that Anne Rand is writing the book, that she would make this so, such a like, blatant black-and-white comparison by literally quoting right out of the Communist Manifesto, this awful factory plan where everyone gets paid the bare minimum to do the best they can. And the result is everyone quits. When you don't yeah. reward your abilities and your talents and your skills and your application of all of those things, when you just pay someone the minimum they require to survive and expect the maximum, you expect them to sacrifice their own dignity to do good for the country with no reward they quit yeah and they have every reason to because there's plenty of other places to work that wouldn't treat them like garbage i mean to actually put to each according to their need from each according to their ability in a business plan is ridiculous and they actually hold interviews with every employee and say and they have a vote they vote to see how much you need and how much you can produce and you get and they tax you if you do yeah. well they give you they pay you if you do poorly and this is where we get to the the awful failings of marxist belief because it sounds great on paper redistribute the money and make everybody work for the good of society but as soon as that work gravel hits the fucking desk it falls apart because what you're actually doing is saying, I want you to do what you're capable of without any tiered payment plan. I want you to heal the sick. I want you to do sophisticated operation. I want you to develop amazing machines. And I want you to make as much as the guy who's only capable of cleaning up after your poop in the toilet stall. Yeah. And that's just not how the human brain works. They talk about this idea, oh, well, it's for the good of your brother and it's for the good of humanity. And it's like, no, it's, it's not. It, it's perpetuating a system that's already established that wasn't ever established with this new philosophy of everyone's working for everyone else. It was established with if you 
do something great, the rewards will be great. And if it benefits society, then there will be an opportunity for you to continue to do great things. And if you distribute the wealth in a way that promotes people to help you get that done, they'll be inclined to do that because their reward will be being able to take that money and live within their means and feel the leisures of paid work and feel like they're worth something like they're valued and when they feel valued they'll work and you take that entire system and you say that's not working sure it's led to the industrial revolution but i don't think that's good enough i think we should just actually make everyone make the same amount of money but still do the same amount of work well it, it it's not how the human brain works yeah absolutely not like we're trained to have some kind of return on investment and if everybody's investing different amounts and getting the same return you, something doesn't align you're not in yeah, because, accordance with nature because right now the system has let's say a million or millions of people are employed doing something they don't love they don't love making parts they're not getting up in the morning to make parts they're not getting up in the morning because they love their job on a whole, I'm sure there's tons of people that love what they do and they're blessed to be able to do what they love and make a profit on it. But yeah, but that's not the majority. The 99% of people are working so they can get paid so they can do the things they love in the time that they have left over. And when you yeah. turn around and say you're getting paid too much to do something that you should love to do because it will help people, you can't just change a brain that way. If you made a society where the baker was baking bread because he loved to bake bread and he didn't need to keep profits because there was a guy who really liked to build houses and there was a guy that really liked to be a plumber and there was a guy that really liked to do this and everybody was just distributing their worth because everyone else was distributing their worth and everybody was a benefit to this highly balanced crazy OCD system where everybody was doing what they loved and it rewarded them and it allowed them the privilege of the leisures that they like and they all felt valued and they felt capable and proud of their work and their contributions to society. Sure, it will work. That's a utopia. Yeah. And it's very easy to write it down on paper, but it's very hard to distribute the masses, the 7 billion people into these communities that require all of these people. Because at the end of the day, 99% of people aren't doing what they love and there isn't room for them to do what they love and they don't know what they love. And what they love may actually oftentimes just be eating Cheetos and drinking beer and watching hockey. So to expect people to just change in a system that was built to confine them to the system that was built to provide for them is just farcical. I don't understand it. Yeah, I think that's uh, one of Ayn Rand's main focuses in this book. It's just a criticism of communism and Marxism and a, a bit of a praise for capitalism, but more focus on yourself as an individual. Don't worry about the rest of it. Exactly. And then if we could just end discussing Hugh Axton. Axton? Axton. Axton. That makes more sense as a word. <laughs> yeah. So when he was touched yeah. on earlier, this great philosopher, yeah. the last philosopher of reason, or perhaps, as he words it, the first returning philosopher of reason. Yeah, I like that Which, a lot. It shows that anybody can be the intermediary between the eras. He doesn't see himself as the end of a dying era is just like, nah, this is a resurrection coming back. And I'm so Dagny, back. Dagny tracks him down on this race to find the inventor of the electrostatic engine, another great invention that will change the world. He's the last link in this chain of people in every corner of the country that she's tracking down, and he's cooking burgers in a diner. One of the greatest philosophers she's ever heard of who taught at the best university, who taught some of the greatest minds, and she offers him a job making way more than he's getting paid right now down in New York at one of her train terminals, and he turns it down. 
And he says, well, it's because I'm a philosopher that I'm turning it down because I know that that won't make me happy. Yeah. The question is almost presented like, hey, why aren't you doing the work of a philosopher? And he replies with, well, because I'm a philosopher, that's why. Yeah, so he's fully established what it takes to be happy and accepts the systems that exist. And he's found himself in a, the middle of nowhere cooking burgers because he likes to cook burgers and he likes it when people like his burgers. And it's yeah. not about saving up lots of money. It's just about existing and preserving that which he has for the future. Yeah, and it goes into uh, the story of his three students who he shared with Dr. Stadler as well. And they each taught Francisco d'Anconia, Ragnar Daniskjold, a pirate who is alluded to in this story, mm -hmm. and a mystery character who we never get a good definition of. Whenever We certainly haven't yet. Whenever the third Ragnar... is brought up, they always say, why, well, you wouldn't know him. He never did anything great. I and mean, I have my speculations as to who he is, but I'm sure that him and Ragnar are going to come up and become key, key players in these next couple parts. Yeah, I think well, Ragnar is going to become definitely a more prominent character when we reveal more of Francisco's story and his aims and his current philosophy. But what was interesting is, so she asks him, Hugh a a asked him, what do you think of your three students and what they've done with themselves? And he says he's just so incredibly proud. Yeah, and that, that means something for the two that we have a backstory of. The guy that ran his business into the ground and, you know, really messed with the Mexican government and their money-making schemes. And then you have a, a, a pirate who goes back and forth from Europe to America just sinking ships and stealing and plundering. And he's proud of them, more than anybody and, in the world. And you've got to wonder from what frame of mind he has this contentment with his students, his, his sons, how he perceives them. But they were like these perfect children, these mm -hmm. three brilliant minds that were studying engineering and philosophy. And he was the philosopher. And he's this philosopher who has put down his hat and said, there's no need for me. I'll just go cook burgers. And he's content with his life. And he's proud of his disciples that are out in the world doing what they feel to be best and their motives have not been explained and fleshed out as of yet but certainly he he has some sort of reason because he did teach the philosophy of reason as to why this is a good thing for them mm -hmm. i guess he still sees growth in them he sees more of their potential than what they currently are i think there's definitely an underlying motive to both of these characters that haven't been revealed yet that it's gonna oh. it's gonna throw a a twist into the story near the end oh certainly and i'm sure it ties into this whole notion of public opinion being generated from nothing mm -hmm. the playboy and the bandit constantly on the scene of propaganda and news you know these are lifestyles that are being demonstrated in full swing and that impacts the human mind that it does and the, uh, the ending of this chapter, of this uh, part one, non-contradiction, is the... Well, first it, it alludes to all the new socialist laws coming out that target any businesses on the Atlantic moving from out of their state and going to Colorado because that's where all the new business is. And it limits the amount of trains going in and out, which completely crushes... Ellis Wyatt's entire corporation. He just developed this new way of getting oil from shale, and he, he's got nothing to do with it now. He can't produce enough with the limitations on him to keep it going. So the chapter ends with Dagny taking her John Galt line and seeing a wall of flame on one side with the entirety of Wyatt oil engulfed in flames and a sign on the door saying you can do what you want with it but i'm gone yeah i left it as i found it it's yours 
Well, I can't wait to see what happens in part two. And yes, it's definitely I'm, been a ride so far. I'm really eager. I'm glad we got this podcast done because I feel as though I can't keep reading until we talk about what we've read. And so I will be diving in again this afternoon to see what does happen next because I am, it's a nail biter. I'm on the edge of my seat with it. And I, I'm really looking forward to seeing how this story unfolds. Absolutely. And I think we can end this video with the third explanation given to us of who is John Galt. If you'll remember back in chapter eight at the ribbon cutting ceremony, so uh, one of the reporter yes. one of the reporters asks Dagny, you know, you call it the John Galt line, but who is John Galt anyway? And she replies, We are Just beautiful. On that note, have a great day. You too, Will. May the force be with you. And also with you. And all the listeners as well. And them too.